In the next three months, you're going to hear a lot about one of the most significant events, not only in our national history, but in the history of Western civilization, because the 70th anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 1944, is nearly upon us. And I thought it would be useful to talk about this momentous occasion for a few minutes this morning in a way that helps us to think about our lives today and the lives of those men on those beaches uh, and what they made possible for us. In this way, I think the past can help to illuminate the present and even help us to think about the future. It offers examples of leadership, camaraderie, of decision-making, right and wrong, uh, from which we can draw lessons and even inspiration. One of the things that World War II generally, and D-Day specifically, ought to tell us is that no matter how difficult your life today, how hard your decisions, how perplexing your situation, others have had it much worse. By 10 a.m., they have routed the Germans from the village of Virville, which is not far from the magnificent American cemetery in Normandy. The battle is a long way from being over, and the war in Europe has another 11 months to go, but the Americans and the British have a toehold and soon will have a foothold. What we see in both Eisenhower and General Coda is adaptability, a quick and rational assessment of options, a willingness to make a decision, and a readiness to take responsibility. You don't have to be on Omaha Beach to see that these fundamental traits of leadership at any level under any circumstances are important. Like every leader, large or small, military or civilian, in war or in peace, the challenge is to get subordinates to row the boat generally in the same direction. 10,000 American and British combat engineers landed with the infantry at Normandy on the morning of June 6, 1944. 10,000. Their first job was to blow holes in the German defenses preventing landing craft from reaching the beaches. So what did they do? The surviving half, those who were not dead, wounded, or missing, led by the leaders and animated by their own fortitude, training, camaraderie, and no doubt anger, finished the job. More gaps were opened in the afternoon, and within 48 hours, nearly all of those 3,700 German obstacles, those pilings and steel barricades the Germans had spent four years in placing, nearly all of them had been removed or destroyed within 48 hours. The 85 enemy machine gun nests on Omaha Beach, known as murder holes, had been cleaned out, along with 35 pillboxes and eight massive German bunkers defending the beaches. By sunset on June 7th, construction crews were building roads, supply dumps, fuel points, airfields, and cemeteries, still under German artillery fire, by the way. Within hours of the German surrender in Cherbourg, American construction crews, engineers, port battalions, and divers had begun a tedious, dangerous, complicated rebuilding of Cherbourg. Within two weeks, the first barge entered the port. In mid-August, the first Liberty ship docked. Cherbourg eventually was handling more than 15,000 tons of cargo every day. It was more than double Allied projections before D-Day. It kept the Allied armies in France from wasting away, and all because some gutful men, laboring largely in anonymity without the headlines that combat leaders were getting, rolled up their sleeves and got it done. If they can do that, what can't we do? The first duty for all of us is to remember our current Poet laureate Natasha Trethway ends her poem, Pilgrimage, which is about a visit to Vicksburg with these lines. In my dream, the ghost of history lies down beside me, rolls over, pins me 
beneath a heavy arm. My ambition, as someone who has spent a professional lifetime writing about war, is for our countrymen also to feel that heavy arm, to feel the palpable presence of those who risked everything and in some instances gave everything for us. It's a human business, legacy we want to leave behind us.